the director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies at UWE, Mona. He has taught political theory, comparative politics, Caribbean political thought, and African-American politics at Michigan State University, Florida International University, Anton de Combe University in Suriname, and the UWE, Mona. He has held positions of visiting fellow at the Center of Latin America Studies at Cambridge, visiting thinker scholar at Stanford University, and visiting scholar of Brown University. He has authored or edited 11 books and many articles on Caribbean politics and political theory. He's a giant in political theory. Among them are Caribbean revolutions and revolutionary theory, an assessment of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Grenada, 1993 and 2001, narratives of resistance, Jamaica, Trinidad, the Caribbean, 2000, envisioning Caribbean futures, Jamaica perspectives, perspectives sorry, 2007, culture, politics, race, and diaspora, the Thought of Stuart Hall, 2007. The Thought of the New World, The Quest for Decolonization with Norman Given, 2010. And Critical Interventions in Caribbean Politics and Theory, 2014. Quite a few books there. He's a poet and is considered as one of the founding voices in Jamaican dub poetry movement. And I hope he gives us a little bit of that. His first novel, Paint the Town Red, was published in 2003. He is a commentator on Jamaican politics and is quoted occasionally in the electronic media, regional newspapers, as well as Time Magazine, The Guardian, The Financial Times, The Miami Herald, and other leading international newspapers and magazines. He has been the public orator at the UWE Mona since 2006. Tonight, Professor Mix will be speaking on the subject beyond the end of sovereignty, recapturing space for humanity in the Caribbean. He is going to ask us to think about the quality of human life beyond the borders of sovereignty that our founding leaders sought for the Caribbean through our independence. During tonight's discourse, he will ask questions and seek answers that can address the ills that threaten to erase the lofty ideas that were born out of a desire to be a truly thousand sovereign people. This has been a highly anticipated event brought to you in my view at a very opportune time. I believe that beyond all questions are the answers that can only be bred out of a spirit of hope. I believe that we can plant seeds through our conversations, our ideas, our dialogues, into our children so they can harvest a future in the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, please join me and welcome Professor Brian Mix. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana, for that stirring too kind introduction. Uh, Monsignor William John Lewis, Dr. Francis Severin, members of the head table with me here. Um, I must recognize in the audience my good friend, Bill Para Riviere, who uh, was a member of staff at the Consortium Graduate School of Social Sciences, one of the progenitors of my Sir Arthur Lewis Institute. But that's not why I'm recognizing him. I'm recognizing him because he's my first teacher of Caribbean history <laughs> when, I, when I was a little boy. <laughs> there's, there's another story there which Bill doesn't even know, in that when, when he was, was kicked out of Trinidad and Tobago, I don't know if many people in this audience know I respected Bill in that in that guise, uh, along with Pat Emanuel, that I was part of a team of students. I, I was a mere child at the time who went down to Shalaramas, where CARICOM or, or was being launched at that very time and handed a letter of protest. How can you be launching a Caribbean union 
when you are removing from your country some of our best sons in the presence of Bill and Pat. Eric Williams didn't listen to us, but nonetheless, he's here in good health, and I'm very happy for that. <laughs> uh, I have two confessions and a caveat before I start. The first confession is that, and it's actually been said already, so Monsignor, it's, it's in the public. Uh, uh, and that is, that is my first visit to Dominica. I say it's a confession because I should have come many, many times before, including invitations from Bill, but, uh, and for various reasons I have been able to come. I'm very happy to be here. Unfortunately, I'm leaving tomorrow, so this is not really a visit. I have to come back. <laughs> and um, in, in the very short time I, I was here, I, I really must thank um, Kimon for um, giving me a whirlwind tour and carry me, carry me down to the tail of Dominica, which is, and you know, you have an extraordinarily beautiful country here, and I, I just have to come back to enjoy it some more. I've always known that the people were beautiful because I've met them everywhere I've been, but being on the land itself has been very, very um, uh, important for me. So I shall return, as Makado <laughs> said. Um, the second confession is that, uh, I must admit that, that in her lifetime, Dame Eugenia's politics and mine were not the same. Um, and when I was given this invitation, I, was, I immediately said yes, because of whom Dame Eugenia Charles is, but particularly because uh, our politics did not necessarily concur on our points while she lived. Because I think there are two things to be learned. Uh, where we are today in the Caribbean, and that is that the differences in our politics were sometimes uh, less than we made them out to be. But more importantly, the policy space that we now live in is such that we have to review the entire way in which we imagine difference in Caribbean politics in light of the 21st century. Uh, I say this in that we have to find ways to carry forward the politics of our uh, countries, both internally and as a region as a whole, that can find points of agreement and points of concurrence in the face of forces that are, are way beyond us. And therefore, um, you know, I, I want to say enough respect to the late Dame Eugenia Charles, uh, I don't think the differences that we disagreed with have changed uh, uh, at all, but that as we look to the future, the people who supported Dame Eugenia Charles and the people who did not, we are going to have to find ways to find common ground. And that is one of the things that is, is very, very important. Now the caveat is that much of this paper uh, uh, refers to uh, the Jamaican situation. I've, I've been spending a lot of time looking at Jamaica. My whole work has not been Jamaican. I've, I've looked at Grenada, the Eastern Caribbean. It's very much, Trinidad is very much a part of my work. But this particular uh, paper out of which this comes came out of the 50th anniversary of Jamaican independence in which we were looking at possible solutions for Jamaica in the face of what many saw as a dead end. So the caveat is that I urge you to read between the lines to sift out where I make Jamaican references and that I'm not at all trying to apply them uh, with a blank slate to, to Dominica. And in, maybe in the discussion pe period, we can begin to talk about uh, what applies and what does not. But I'm not at all trying to do uh, or make the mistake of using examples from one jurisdiction in the Caribbean to suggest that all of these uh, proposals are applicable in any one-to-one -one way to all jurisdictions. So, so read, read my discussion with, 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 with that filter, and we can hopefully have a good discussion at the end. Uh, I start my lecture by mentioning two quarrels that I've had with colleagues. Oh, there's one other before I start. There's one other little uh, confession, and that is that in coming here and choosing my tie, I forgot that elections were going on in, uh. in <laughs> uh, It's when I landed uh, and began to drive over the hill, I said, oh my goodness, why didn't I choose uh, a gray tie? 
<laughs> so the tie has no, no meaning whatsoever. I start my lecture by mentioning two quarrels that I've had with colleagues and friends over the past decade or so. The first is with David Scott, a respected Caribbean, the Jamaican anthropologist at Columbia University, and a thesis he has elaborated over three remarkable books. The books are, um, I refer to them as a trilogy, even though he doesn't do so. They are called Refashioning Futures, this first, the second, Conscripts of Modernity, and the third, Omens of Adversity. While it does significant damage to try in any tidy way uh, to, to summarize Scott's complicated arguments across these three volumes, one can nonetheless wade in and suggest that at the heart of his contention is the notion that we are witnessing in the first decades of the 21st century a profound ending, the end of the Bandung generation of the mid to late 20th century is also the end of an era in which anti-colonial revolution was what to social and political life for not only the newly independent countries but radical movements in the West in general. It is perhaps useful to quote Scott to capture the tenor and mood of his argument. In Omens of Adversity, the third of, of this trilogy, his focus is on tragedy and temporality, in particular the quote, temporality of the aftermaths of political catastrophe, the temporal disjunctures in living on in the wake of past political time, amid the ruins specifically of post-socialist and post-colonial futures past, unquote. Captured here in miniature is the atmosphere of Scott's melancholic proposal that not only has an era come to an end, but that we are at the absolute ending of things. My response to this is both to recognize the self-evident truth that the Bandung modality of anti-colonial resistance has come to an end, but also to part company with Scott's absolutism. Forms of struggle based on nationalism and captured in the anti-colonial movement may have abated, but the struggle continues for an equitable use of natural resources, for a sustained engagement with the environment, for gender equality, for social justice, and against racism, as we can see in the, in the egregious instance of Ferguson in the United States. But further, these forms operate both at a global level through new transnational alliances and coalitions, but also at the traditional national and local levels. One searches in vain through Scott's work to find any such sustained engagement with the simple reality that despite significant changes that merit the recognition of our post-Bandung era, Bandung referring to the place in Indonesia where all the non-aligned leaders came together back in the 1950s, time and politics continue in this, the new dispensation. The second argument comes from a set of debates with uh, Hilborn Watson from Barbados and Lyndon Lewis from both Barbados and Guyana, and both were at Bucknell University and others around a familiar discourse elaborated in the Caribbean context in Lewis's edited volume, Caribbean Sovereignty, Development and Democracy in an Age of Globalization. Watson in particular has argued, using classical Marxist references, that sovereignty is essentially a misnomer for the power of particular social classes, and in the Caribbean it has meant the power of the bureaucratic middle classes over the people. That this power has been eroded, as Watson suggests, is unquestionable, but it isn't clear what is left in its place. Indeed, it is one thing for Watson to recognize the severe constraints on state sovereignty and maneuverability, quite another to suggest, as he has, that, quote, the neocolonial state has no capacity for autonomous action, unquote. This absolutist, take it or leave it stance on the question of sovereignty echoes of which are to be found in Scott's arguments derives in part from what I consider a mistaken monolithic notion of sovereignty and power, which requires further thought and consideration. My argument is to suggest that in order to better understand the position of and possibilities for small, particular Caribbean polities, particularly Caribbean polities in the contemporary world, we need to first nuance sovereignty by disaggregating it. Krasner, for instance, has suggested that sovereignty might better be understood if we recognize its three components. 
He divides it into international juridical sovereignty, that is your place in the world of nation states, Westphalian battalion sovereignty, the way, the way in which you can actually do things as a nation state, and domestic sovereignty, that is control in the domestic space of a particular state. Elsewhere, using this approach and looking at uh, Jamaica, I have suggested while, while there ha that while there have been incursions undermining the effectiveness of the Jamaican state in all three areas, they have been of different magnitudes and with varying effects. In summary, while sovereignty has been eroded, it has by no means led to the negation of power in any of these three corridors. Certainly even in the balkanized context of the Caribbean, with a multitude of minuscule states, we can suggest that while sovereignty is and has always been limited, these polities are not entirely impotent. What is to be made then of these state forms that still control swaths of power domestically and continue to cut a distinct if limited profile in the international arena? Sovereignty, I propose, should always be seen as complex, layered, and to be located on a continuum. That is, it, it is never absolutely not there or absolutely entirely there. It's somewhere in between. From such a perspective, endings are thus also realistically beginning. So the end of Bandung is the beginning of something else. And the questions as to what strategies and tactics to engage in, to face and interface with the new global order are eminently political questions. What sorts of alliances and coalitions and around what sorts of programs are possible in the nonetheless extraordinarily difficult conditions of the early 21st century for Caribbean states? What can we make then of power and people's lives after sovereignty? And by after sovereignty, I'm simply referring to the way in which people have argued sovereignty has ended. And I'm arguing that it has not. Having laid that foundation, however, I want to appear to contradict myself by reminding us that the second decade of the 21st century has revealed the real extent on the limitations of, of power and maneuverability of the state and of post-colonial states in general. And nowhere is this more evident than in the Caribbean. I use the instance of my own island and place of residence, Jamaica, to further elaborate this point. In September 2014, the polls in the venerable Jamaica newspaper, The Gleaner, suggested a drastic fall in support for the People's National Party, PNP government, and even more startling, an unprecedented plummet in support for the charismatic Prime Minister, Portia Simpson Miller. Veteran poster Bill Johnson, in his remarks on his work in the field, noted that not only did the PNP now trail the opposition Jamaica Labour Party by 12 points, but Simpson Miller, who had been consistently the most popular Jamaican politician of the past two decades, was for the first time considered in an unfavorable light by a significant plurality of those polled. Even more noteworthy is that less than three years before, she and her party had been returned to power with a resounding victory at the polls. At the time, Jamaica had been in an extraordinarily precarious position. The standing JLP government, recognizing belatedly the depth of the 2007 economic crisis, had ent entered into both a debt restructuring arrangement and an IMF agreement. However, when the most difficult aspects of the agreement were to be implemented, the cabinet backed away from making the hard choices. Almost simultaneously under Bruce Golding's leadership, the government was swept into the severest political crisis in three decades surrounding what came to be known as the Dodos events. In 2008, the government had received a request from the United States for the extradition of Christopher Dodos Koch, a notorious don or drugs dealing gangster and erstwhile supporter of the JLP from the inner city community of Tivoli Gardens. Over a two year period of the most extraordinary prevarication and obfuscation, the government, faced with State Department pressure and, insist and, and State Department insistence on treaty rights, along with significant local opposition from civil society, eventually relented and issued an arrest warrant for Koch. The outward show of support for Dodos and the delays initiated by the Golding regime contributed to a sense of untouchability, which encouraged Dodos to arm and barricade his supporters into what had overnight become the fortress of Tivoli Gardens. The subsequent attempt by the Jamaican police and army to capture him led to outright war and more than 70 deaths and has generated a continuing controversy over the use of military force 
and the legality of what has become known as the Tivoli incursion. It was in this atmosphere of revulsion with the GLP administration that Golding himself resigned as prime minister in the hope that the youthfulness of his replacement, Andrew Holness, would serve as a trump card in the upcoming elections. This, however, was not to be, and the GLP lost the December 2011 election decisively. One of the critical points to note, however, was the low turnout at the polls, where just over 53% of the electorate voted in the lowest vote since the first poll under universal adult suffrage in 1944. This can only be interpreted as an indication of a growing alienation with the political system when correlated against other indicators, such as the Latin American Public Opinion Project's polls, which in 2010 found that only 55.8% of the people supported the Jamaican political system placing the country squarely in the bottom quartile of 26 Latin American and Caribbean countries in which the same question, that is support for the political system, had been asked. La LEPOP, that's the name of the Latin American system, had also found that only 33.5% of respondents considered political parties as trustworthy institutions, with only the police as an institution garnering less support than the political parties. While, in terms of satisfaction with democracy, whereas in 2006, 51.5% expressed satisfaction, by 2010, a minority, only 45.3% expressed similar feelings. I should probably, at this point, drink a little water. Good, I can continue. What are the factors that might account for this stunning turnaround in support after only two years of what appeared to be a decisive victory at the polls? The more substantial answers, of course, are to be found in a long history of damagingly competitive two-party clientelistic politics in which neither party has been able to eliminate entrenched poverty, reduce dramatically high unemployment rates, or deliver long periods of sustained growth. This has been accompanied and enhanced by what I have, I have elsewhere described as hegemonic dissolution, or the crumbling of the unwritten social understanding or compact between the political elites and the subaltern classes. The result has been a three decade long process of rudderless meandering in which no social bloc has been able to place its decisive imprint and guidance on the direction of the political ship. The more immediate answer is to be found in the IMF staff level agreement negotiated by the new Simpson Miller government in its first year in office and implemented to the letter since April 2013. The agreement demanded, in addition to a managed default, the second in the space of five years, a hermetic seal on wage increases, extraordinarily tight fiscal policies, including a remarkable 7.5% primary surplus and a significant devaluation of the Jamaican dollar. The results of the draconian measures over the past two years has been damaging to salaried workers and the poor, even as it has brought a significant measure of improvement and stability to Jamaica's fiscal position, which over the past three decades, but particularly since the 2007 crisis, has been, uh, to put it mildly, precarious. I suggest, however, that the secular decline in voter support combined with the collapse of an older pattern of rotating parties every two electoral cycles to a more erratic pattern of rapid shifts in support is suggesting a deeper dissatisfaction with politics in Jamaica connected to the notion of hegemonic dissolution, but which in many respects is Caribbean-wide. The global economic crisis of 2007 has had a deep and lasting impact on the Caribbean, and I think I'm speaking to the converted here. Felt acutely in Jamaica, St. Kitts, Antigua, St. Lucia, Dominica, Grenada, and the other islands dependent on the tourist industry, its effect was somewhat shallower, though still profound, in the mineral-based economies of Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname. The Inter-American Development Bank, in an important paper published this year, underlines the severity of the economic climate in the region, but arrives at the conclusion that the impact of the economic downturn only revealed an underlying fragility, which it vividly described as a Caribbean sclerosis. Measuring regional territories against the rest of the small economies in the world 
which the IDB refers to as ROSE, the acronym for, for, for that. The IDB concluded that in the Caribbean, there were lower levels of trust for politicians, there were more instances of unproductive rent seeking, there was a greater degree of wastefulness in government spending and government officials showed greater favoritism to preferred business partners than occurred in rows, the rest of the small economies in the world. The Caribbean also suffered from a weak private sector with a preponderance of small firms less open to international trade and with business persons more likely to make irregular payments and bribes than in other small comparative states. The Caribbean also comes out negatively on macroeconomic indicators, where debt was on average 1.7 times more than among rows, leaving very limited fiscal space in which to employ countercyclical policies, because to, to employ Keynesian countercyclical policies for the economic uh, uh, minds in the room, you need to have uh, at least a basic economic foundation to, to, to pump capital into the economy. If you don't have any capital, you can't pump, pump it into the economy to get the countercyclical effect. Or to accumulate buffers to protect against future crises, both economic and natural. And of course, we know about natural crises. These were compounded by the reality that the region was far more than rose, prone to the full spectrum, as I just suggested, of natural disasters, and was residing, as it were, in a bad neighborhood. In other words, linked to countries that were either stagnant or growing at a slow rate and therefore not able to assist in pulling their neighbors along. I like this idea of a bad neighborhood. The key, the key element in that bad neighborhood, by the way, is the United States, which is considered, in comparison to the BRICS, a, 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 a stagnant country. And this, is, this was written in 2013. In other words, uh, uh, yes, sorry. All small economies suffered, the IDB concluded, from the limitation of markets and resources. But the Caribbean's problems were compounded by their politics and social and economic policies, making them as a region what the IDB described as outliers. Harsh as the IDB's conclusions may seem, they have, in many respects, a ring of truth. The entire Anglophone Caribbean, with perhaps the exception of petroleum-rich Trinidad and Tobago, is in a state of economic stasis. Jamaica, which has barely grown economically for the past three decades, or your own Dominica, with negative growth in 2012 and 2013, uh, you know, before that very anemic uh, growth, are not even the obvious choices to demonstrate this point, but rather Barbados. For two decades, Barbados' model of social partnership, avoidance of direct engagement with the IMF, and the maintenance of a social democratic approach to, to the distribution of welfare benefits seemed to work and set an example of what was possible in a small, resource-poor island. But the true fragility of the Barbadian model could be seen in its less well-advertised features, such as the decision to sell unrenewable assets, particularly scarce beachfront land, to rich foreigners significantly driving up real estate prices for ordinary Barbadian wage earners and providing only short and temporary fixes to fiscal imbalances. Following the tourism downturn after 2008, all the flaws in this model were sharply revealed and today Barbados faces an unprecedented fiscal crisis which has contributed to an unraveling of the social welfare benefits that have held the society together over much of the post-colonial period. The severity of the moment for the entire region is captured in a quote from a speech made by the late Norman Gervon at the Solis 5050 conference, 50 years, and his speech was titled 50 Years of In-Dependence in Jamaica, held in 2012, and I quote Norman, trade preferences are on the way out, aid flows have been cut, the Caribbean doesn't have the strategic importance it used to have. There is a world food crisis, an energy crisis, and an environmental crisis. Transnational criminal organizations commanding huge resources have pushed up our murder rates to be among the highest in the world. Demands on government are exploding while resources are shrinking, and indebtedness has grown, in a, has, grown, has grown. In a recent paper, I spoke of the looming possibility of a perfect storm of intersecting developments that could end up profoundly affecting the existence of Caribbean societies as we know them. Existential threats, unquote. 
What then, in the light of economic stasis and possibly existential crisis, are the realistic options? Reflecting on the past for a moment, we can suggest three models that have been attempted. First, in the 60s, the newly independent nations adopted W. Arthur Lewis's industrialization by invitation approach, which centered on gearing for ex and, and Lewis's approach, interestingly, centered on gearing for exports. And the country that actually adopted Lewis was Singapore, but which was transformed in the Caribbean into a tariff-based import substitution model. The potential for growth in the context of small, even micro markets, was exhausted before the end of the first independence decade. And we think you know about Jamaica and Trinidad by the, by the late 60s, that the potential in a, in a controlled market had already been exhausted. This failure manifests in rising unemployment rates and disenchantment with the first decade of independence contributed immeasurably to the second model, an incipient radical socialist orientation approach also based on import substitution but with the assumption of strategic assistance in technology and resources from the socialist countries and exemplified in the diverse instances of the Cooperative Socialist Republic of Guyana, the democratic socialism of Michael Manley's regime in Jamaica, and Grenada under the People's Revolutionary Government, PRG, from 1979 to 1983. First, all adopted the view that the Soviet Union was both able and willing to provide meaningful assistance, an assumption that was patently false, and soon to be proven by the rise of Gorbachev and the events that would lead to the collapse of what then was called really existing socialism. But further, one searches for a novel and potentially convincing approach to economic development, and all three instances fall short in this respect. There were, for sure, some novel political experiments, such as the popular consultation around the drafting of the People's Production Plan in Jamaica in 1977 and the popular discussion of the annual budget in Grenada between 1981 and 1983. But even Grenada, the most radical political experiment, never really departed from a typical tourism model, with the main project being the construction of the international airport to facilitate inter alia tourism. The third instance, as elaborated in the IDB study, is the services model, based primarily on tourism, and this is the one that we have been following in many parts of the Caribbean since at least the, the 1980s. The IDB suggests that the tourism model ad adapted in the 80s was a creative initiative that allowed for growth and expansion over two decades, but is now largely exhausted as a source of dynamism and growth. I think this is a tremendous overstatement of its successes. The model never generated employment in depth, failed to establish significant linkages into the rest of the economy, particular agriculture, and with the general adaptation in the 90s of the all-inclusive format led to the further, further ghettoization of tourism and the greater alienation of the local population uh, from feeling that tourism was their own. I make these points to nonetheless suggest that we can agree with much in the IDB's conclusions. The Caribbean islands and territor territories have for the most part been the outliers. Small size generally is a constraint to development but the Caribbean has lagged behind the rest of the small economies of the world. So it's not just small size. And what of the IDB's way forward? First, the bank argues, and it is difficult to dispute, that there are simply some major macroeconomic questions that need to be addressed if any viable model of development based ultimately on growth and broad-based prosperity is to be pursued. Huge fiscal deficits cannot be sustained indefinitely. Any host, uh, holder can tell you that. Neither can highly overvalued currencies in a world of closely interconnected economies. I want to offer the caveat, however, that the specific debates on the question of devaluation need to be critically pursued in far great, greater detail on an island-by-island -island basis. And I'm thinking here about Eastern Caribbean uh, currencies. So I don't think this is a general, by any means, a general rule that, that we need to consider. Between these general statements and the specific decisions as to where fiscal cuts should be made and whether devaluation should be internal or external and which sectors of the economy should bear the burden, there are, of course, huge debates and huge differences between countries in the region and within countries in the region. 
and it is precisely on this field of the politics and the social implications of macroeconomic adjustment that the IDB is silent and found wanting, and a point that we shall return to in the paper, the rem in, in the latter part of my presentation. The remainder of the IDB paper is devoted as to how to make Caribbean economies grow by instituting a range of policies that will facilitate competitiveness and enhance their export potential. And I won't list them, but just to say that um, I'm sure everybody in Dominica knows the usual list of uh, getting business right, getting our, our um, uh, institutional rules right, etc., to allow us to grow. And so I'm, I'm not going to list them. In addition to these, emphasis is placed on the development of small and medium enterprises as critical agents in export-led growth, and importantly, in response to the notion of a stagnant neighborhood, they quote, fostering and development of new neighbors. In other words, the creation of trading ties to countries that are on a steeper growth path than the United States, meaning places like Brazil, uh, China, etc. Again, there is much in these conclusions that can be debated, but also that uh, one can agree, agree with. First, it is indisputable that the older approaches of import substitution underlined by the small size of local markets were infeasible and any project of sustained growth is going to have to be export-led. Second, and a corollary of the first point, is that an export-led economy will have to be competitive or it won't survive. You can export, but if, not, if nobody wants to buy it or it's too expensive, you're not going to sell it or you're going to sink in the Caribbean Sea. Thirdly, not literally. Uh, thirdly, given the inability of Caribbean labor to compete with the cheapest labor supplies in the world, located in East and South Asia, and increasingly Africa, as Africa is drawn into the global system, any new Caribbean export-oriented approach will have to move to occupy middle and upper echelons of the production process, requiring a highly trained and, comp and competent workforce. If these are incontestable arguments, then what are the real possibilities? One of the things that struck me, and I'm, I'm, I'm moving off text to just say that in the course of today, um, I had um, Kimon running down for me the two manifestos of, of the political parties. Uh, so at least I would be able to read them before coming and speaking tonight. And in, in, the, in the hour or so before I came here, I was going through that. What struck me about both manifestos is that they're quite good. I mean, it's not, it's not as though, you know, they're completely off the page and they're in some alternative universe. Uh, the, the manifestos are actually quite good. Um, I, you know, there, there are n l not a lot of, there really is not a lot of policy space in the Caribbean. The other thing that struck me is that they're very similar. <laughs> <laughs> and there really is n not a lot of difference between the two parties. There are just so many things that Dominicans can, can think about what is possible for us to do. Uh, but having said that, what is missing, I think, and this is where I, I return to my text, um, is that it isn't at all clear as to whether there's any broader, more visionary strategy for midterm growth and prosperity. There's a lot about fixing, fixing things and putting certain things in place, and some of them are really attractive. I, I think, for example, that the, the, the you know, and I, I don't want to jump in here in the deep end of, of Dominican politics, but, but the, the geothermal initiative is very interesting, looking at somebody from Jamaica, the idea of just dealing with the poor thing one time. It may not be feasible, I don't want to go there. But it is very interesting as, as, as a concept. Some of the things on the United Workers Party's platform in terms of their economic strategy uh, are very interesting. But then I open the Labour Party's um, manifesto and I'm seeing similar things written in a different way. Uh, so um, I want to come back to that point about policy space. I started with that. I raise it again and I want to come back to it. But uh, the problem, what I'm not seeing is, uh, is a, a longer visionary notion of where we go for the midterm. And I'm using the midterm here, not in a Caribbean sense. We have a two-year horizon of the short term and maybe a five-year horizon of the midterm. I'm using it in a Chinese sense, uh, that the midterm is 100 years, you know, and the long term is half a, a, a millennium. Uh, maybe a little extreme, but, but they have a sense of where they are going and how they are going to get there. I'm getting a sense as to what you need to write to win an election uh, from our platforms. And Dominica is not unique in this respect. This is exactly what you see in, in Jamaica as well. 
Certainly in the present moment, there, 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 there are some positive things that I think we're doing. Um, the, Eastern Car the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and its continuing momentum towards a closer union of the Windward and Le Leeward Islands is a positive. Uh, it's very, very important, so long as we remember that the Windward and Leeward Islands together still constitute uh, 600,000 people, half a million people. I, I, I don't remember the exact figures. It's a very small, a very, very small village in, in, in Guangzhou, uh, somewhere in China. It's a small village in, in, um, in Colombia. And uh, let's not even think about it, about China. But it's important. But what is the OECS economic project beyond the evident push to improve fiscal imbalances and make the rules better for business? Again, certainly the attempt in Dominica and elsewhere to upgrade the infrastructure of public goods. Uh, these are important initiatives. But where is the model that will take us beyond looking for salvation from enclave offshore universities with limited value added and the sale of citizenship with incalculable legal, diplomatic, and security dangers to the very survival of the already seriously compromised sovereignty of the state? One can understand the absence of immediately obvious alternatives and the desperation out of which suboptimal options may be selected. But this does not take away from their suboptimality, nor can it forestall the search for alternatives. To give cred credit to the government of Jamaica, and this is, is a, by now you will recognize that this is not at all because I am Jamaica, it has elaborated with significant fanfare the notion of a logistics hub option. And I want to explore that as one possible way to look at the future where a set of industries centered on Jamaica's known deep harbor facilities and strategic location as an entrepot for trade out of the Panama Canal is being proposed. This, it is suggested, might serve as the basis of a new post-tourism modality of development centered on trade, assembly, and shipping with the real potential, potential for linkages up and down the production chain. So you bring a TV which is unfinished from China, send it through the Panama Canal, bring it to Jamaica, and then you, you put in the features that will make it European ready, um, PAL, uh, British ready, CCAM, North American ready, NTSC, and you ship it out from there. The value added uh, is that you is in the, is, is the sub-assembly, uh, and um, it benefits China because they can get it out quickly, and you take, take care of the, of the sub-markets in the western part of the world. Um, and of course, Jamaica's location has been an asset since the 16th century, when it was an ideal place to attack the bullion shipments from Peru and Colombia traveling through Havana to Spain, and that is Captain uh, Morgan and Port Royal and all of that work works. A logistics hub might serve as a way of kick-starting a series of industries and internal linkages, taking advantage of growing international trade with the expansion of the Panama Canal and the super ships expected to pass through its expanded channels in the immediate future. Imagine for the moment Kingston as a vibrant trading and manufacturing center in which semi-finished flat screen televisions, I've said that already, um, uh, imagine if the existence of a number of logistics oriented plants were to generate entirely new industries benefiting from the fact that there is already a hub of common location and synergies. Imagine further an entirely different option and here I move beyond the Jamaican government's suggestion to my own. Taking advantage of the Caribbean's, and more particularly in this instance, Jamaica's name recognition in the athletics industry. Potential opportunities might be explored to build both hard industries around athletics equipment, track surfaces, footwear, and the like, as well as soft industries around design, public relations, and promotions, and of course, sports tourism, using the region's proximity to North America and Europe for winter training. Such an imaginary might also be applied with even greater success to the entertainment industry with the possibility of concentrating industries into a sort of regional Nashville Hollywood complex around the production of reggae, soca, reggaeton, cadence, compa, salsa, and the, we could go on, by the way, and mention 10 others, and the myriad music forms that the Caribbean has given to the world. The question, however, as to whether even a logistics hub accompanied by initiatives in sports and entertainment and other yet unimagined options would dig deeply enough to both undermine recalcitrant unemployment and kickstart the economy is a real one. I have suggested that in the Jamaican case, 
whatever vanguard approach is adopted, it needs to be considered alongside a thoroughgoing rural land reform. Such a land reform based on the transparent and democratic redistribution of government-owned lands, the government being the largest landowner, would allow for a long-delayed social restructuring, redistributing equity across the society and restoring some balance between rural and urban parts of the country. It would open up the economic, social, and political space for the other initiatives to survive and thrive. This, by the way, is the South Korean and, and Taiwanese model uh, which was adopted uh, and which modeled themselves of the Japanese model uh, of a century earlier. However, whatever mix of projects eventually comes to the fore, they would critically demand as prerequisites a politics that would generate a commonality of purpose, a socially peaceful environment, a highly trained and competent workforce, and a framework of medium-term planning, along with assurances of a stable business atmosphere that would encourage corporations to invest for the long haul. I want to go over those points. The politics and the socially peaceful environment, a uh, stable atmosphere. All of these features requirements in different ways are missing from the contemporary Jamaican and I su suggest, with differences, the broader Caribbean scenario. There is also the critical requirement for at least some minimal regional framework of understanding, if not a division of labor, as opposed to the present seemingly free-for-all context, where Nicaragua is considering a new canal. The Bahamas and Cuba are building or have already completed their own mega shipping terminals and logistics hubs. The Brazilians are building a road through Guyana with plans to transship their products across the region in mind. And all of this is happening without any common sense of purpose and direction from CARICOM or the individual nations of the Caribbean. Missing from the entire IDB approach too, as I have intimated, are the all important political and cultural questions. The process of getting the macroeconomic equation right as outlined in the IDB's argument, is not simply a policy move, it is a political move. It is a political system that stands in the way of getting the macroeconomic questions right. The situation over the next two years in Jamaica can be stated like this. In order to establish some degree of stability, fiscal and monetary measures must be maintained, which in the short run bring real hardships to working people. Politicians, as they see their support falling at the polls, will be sorely tempted to deviate from these measures in order to win elections, as they have done in the past. Indeed, unless there is a clear attempt to address the political and behind it the cultural underpinnings of the contemporary Jamaican situation, the Caribbean, I suggest, as a whole, there is little chance of avoiding these oscillations as governments seek to win votes in order to win elections. This is bread and butter of Caribbean politics. The problem of the Caribbean variant of the Westminster system, first past the post-political system, must be high on the agenda of any change. Under Westminster, there is sharp contestation, usually between two dominant parties. The winner takes all, both at the individual constituency level, where the candidate who is first past the post and has either a simple majority in a two-candidate race or obtains the plurality of votes wins the seat. Similarly, the party with the majority of seats or the largest plurality forms the government. This has facilitated stable political systems with clear lines of transition in comparison to presidential systems and other voting forms, particularly variants of proportional representation, which, which lead to less than decisive outcomes. However, there are clear negatives that have become more prominent over the years, including most prominently the powerful incentive not to want to lose in a context where the winners take all and the losers are left with nothing. Thus, the most obvious comparison is with the US system, where the president may belong to one party and Congress controlled by another, as is the case today. Control of the House in the Westminster system inevitably means control of the executive as well and by implication, the exclusion of the opposition from any aspect of the decision-making apparatus. There is a strong incentive, therefore, to do everything to win and to never lose, as losing leads literally into the political wilderness. Located in countries with sharply divisive political cultures, 
fractured along lines of class, color, and now political party, tribalism, which has become cultural because it has been around for so long. And with few avenues for survival outside of politics, the end result is that incumbents will do everything to win, and outsiders will do everything not to remain outsiders. The critical question, it would seem, and one that has occupied the thoughts of parliamentary reformers in the Caribbean for decades, is how to retain the obvious benefits of a clean, decisive electoral mechanism while minimizing the exclusive character of the present system. The, ex the exclusive character, the, the way in which it excludes the opposition of the present system. To this end, and in conclusion, I want to make a number of suggestions as to a way forward. First, modify Westminster. The first proposal, proposal I wish to make relates to the modification of the Caribbean Westminster parliamentary system. How can we avoid the indecisiveness of presidential forms and proportional representational forms while incorporating their positive elements? How can we maintain some of the decisiveness of prime ministerial government without conceding to its more dictatorial elements? Uh, the prime minister is a dictator. I'm not speaking about the, the sitting Dominican prime minister. I'm speaking about all prime ministers under the Westminster system who remain, who can pass any law they want any day or else they're no longer prime minister. And that, I think, is something that we need, we need to consider very carefully. We don't want the American system where today President Obama is hamstrung by the fact that his, his, his legislation is going to be vetoed even before he writes it by, by the two houses. It's not going to be passed by the two houses. He can veto their stuff, but, but they won't, won't let his stuff through either. So there's, there's gridlock. These are, aspect, are matters that have exercised the minds of constitutional scholars in the region for a long time. The broad approach around which there's significant consensus is to find some means of retaining the best features of both either through the adaptation of first-past-the-post constituencies in the lower house and proportional representation in the upper in those countries that have two houses, unlike Dominica, of course, or in single assembly constitutions, the judicious mixing of both systems in a single chamber. There's more to be said on the advantages and disadvantages of this approach, and there are country-specific is issues which we can discuss. But the underlying intention must be to undermine the power of a single party and a single prime minister while avoiding degeneration into gridlock in whatever approach is adopted. So we, we deal with first principles that we can talk about implementation. Towards this end, the method of organizing elections and delineating voting districts is also crucial. And the Electoral Commission of Jamaica, which incorporates both dominant parties as well as non-partisan members in an institution that has taken electoral matters out of the hands of the government. The government does not have the decisive say in the, in the Electoral Commission of Jamaica. It's one functioning model of cooperation that needs to be looked at carefully and perhaps replicated or adapted where appropriate. The second thing I want to propose is the deepening of democracy. How can we address the growing alienation of the people from politics, particularly the young, through an unprecedented attempt to deepen the democratization of the political system. Among the most important points I suggest would be the immediate democratization of the annual budget debate. And I borrow this without apology from Grenada. The budget is the most important single economic policy initiative in any calendar year. A budget that was pre-circulated in draft in a simple form could then solicit popular opinions using both traditional meetings across the entire country as well as the internet. While there are growing debates around the effectiveness of crowdsourcing and real questions as to what to include and delete from a range of popular op opinions, the introduction of an open debate accompanied by voting, as in the 2012 Icelandic Constitution, can only be a step in the right direction and away from what we have now, which is alienation and exclusion. Other pertinent interventions might include the creation in each constituency of a single constituency office involving all political parties in order to facilitate the transparent distribution of scarce benefits. One of the certain ways to break the winner-takes-all notion and at the same time undermine clientelism and victimization is to involve the losers in the system of scarce benefits distribution. After all, there are losing members of the, there are members of the losing party in that same constituency as well. Um, why can't we consider a form that follows that road? There's more to be said about removing it entirely from the constituency level, 
But to the extent that this is entrenched, then distribution should be open and non-partisan. Partisan. And a third, but by no means final point, would be the establishment of some popular control on the power of the elected member of parliament between elections, either by instituting a process of recall or as tried in the St. Vincent reform experiment, which sadly was defeated in referendum, constitutionally requiring the MP to report annually on the work that he or she has done, in which case the manifesto, both the constituency manifesto as well as perhaps the national manifesto, becomes a legal document uh, which re requires, uh, if not success in implementation, efforts in that direction which can be, which can be uh, recorded. Such an initiative might not in itself end the tradition of effective prime ministerial dictatorship, but would recover some power on behalf of the people at the lower ends of the decision-making process. Uh, my third point is to engage the diaspora. The diaspora looms large in the Caribbean. In many islands, well over 70% of the tertiary educated workforce has migrated. In Jamaica and Ghana, and I didn't look at the Dominican figures before I came, the figure is in excess of 80%. 80% of the tertiary educated university students, including all University of the West Indies students, don't live in the country. Um, the returns from remittances, as illustrated in, in Prachi Mishra's it's an Indian Economist 2004 study, pale in comparison, however, to the loss in gross domestic product over time to the economy. So anybody in this notion of training for export, you need to think about it again. Uh, uh, the, the case of Jamaica between 1980 and 2002, a 22-year period, suggests that we lost 20.4% of our gross domestic product in, 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 in terms of the wealth that the people who left would have produced. Um, at the same time, we got 7.4% return from remittances. So we, we lost 13% of everything in the people going away. And that is just in, in an economic sense. It doesn't speak about the the, the role model nurturing loss, which we do when, when our, our community leaders and our, our role models have left the country. That, that is immeasurable. Um, this, this, as I said, leaves a deficit of some 13%, though this overall hemorrhage from the economy cannot be properly calculated. Diasporic individuals nonetheless play a huge role in economic survival at both macro and micro levels. They also play an increasingly important role in direct voting. I, I think Do Dominica is aware of that, that they come back to vote. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's controversial, so I won't say any more, it's election time. <laughs> and in opinion formation through online letters to the editor, participation in talk radio, etc. There is no doubt that the diaspora will be a part of the political future as they are a part of the present. They are already a part of the present. The question is what constitutional role might they play and how might diaspora local relations be developed so as to provide mutual benefits from both communities. As I said on a program here this morning, you can't have taxation without representation. You are taxing the diaspora. You can't ask them uh, not to be represented. Um, the notion of direct participation in a single elected assembly is problematic as it could end up in those countries with proportionately large diaspora populations for the diaspora candidates winning, winning uh, the election and therefore policy being determined by a population which is not immediately subject on a daily basis to all the laws that are being implemented by them. That can't work. The alternative would be to legislate for designated seats in the house houses for the diaspora that would provide some influence without that influence being decisive. Again, we're stating first principles here. Actual implementation requires tremendous degree of thought. I want to move on to my fourth point, which is a rethink of regional integration. I agree that the model of trade integration is largely moribund, and in many respects has failed. That was a CARICOM model. It was a CARIFTA model. It was a CARICOM model. It, was, it is a CSME model in many respects, but it has failed. Um, as also suggested by the IDB. However, this doesn't preclude a different avenue to Caribbean integration that would first involve the freer movement of people across the region, of which important initiatives have already been taken to allow qualified citizens to obtain CARICOM work certificates and to seek employment in member countries, and travel restrictions have been significantly eased. Well, we know about the debates about the Mary case in Barbados. There are all sorts of issues which have come up. But much of this remains on paper 
And the recent history of individuals being detained and harassed when visiting neighboring countries suggests that there's a long way to go before legislation becomes reality. Yet it would seem to me that if a project of Caribbean integration is to have real meaning, then it must not only allow goods and financial payments to cross national boundaries freely, but labor markets must also be allowed to clear. It's basic economics. You can't clear some markets without allowing the others to clear. This would also have to be accompanied by a wholesale rethinking of the cost of travel within the Caribbean, as under the present circumstances, it is far cheaper to travel to North America than to neighboring islands. Everybody in this room knows that. Uh, some literally visible to each other across the Caribbean Sea. There is secondly the need to advance further cooperation in areas in which it has already been successful and where the requirements demand cooperation. Among these, one can mention education, where the CXC is one of our big successes. The University of the West Indies uh, is another big success. Um, I, I would like to say that Caribbean cricket is a third success, but we leave that off the agenda of today's discussion. <laughs> also, there's, there are the instances of meteorology, climate, disaster preparedness, all of which have worked with some effect to address the numerous natural hazards from hurricanes to earthquakes, volcanoes, and potential tsunamis that face the Caribbean. To these can be added security, particularly intensified regional and extra-regional cooperation against the tide of drug and gun running that is threatening to overwhelm the region. Green economy initiatives and sustainable initiatives, such as possibly the geothermal initiative, which is, which is very interesting to me. Um, and of course, the coordination of big project questions like logistics hubs, new ports, canals, etc., in ways that even if it is not always possible to end up with a win-win outcome, might at minimum avoid harmful and unnecessary competition. More immediately, it would seem that in negotiating, to use the IDB term, with new neighbors, such as the Chinese, there is an urgent necessity to come together and craft a long-term Caribbean plan for interaction, as China undoubtedly has a long-term plan for interaction with the Caribbean. There is also the urgent requirement for the further and full integration of health, as underlined by the recent Ebola outbreak, and the frighteningly ineffective way in which the present chikungunya outbreak in the region has been handled, acting as startling reminders of the dangers of complacency. And I'm a chikungunya um, survivor myself. <laughs> While sub-regional attempts at closer integration of the more traditional and direct political sort, referring particularly to the advanced attempts at integration taking place in the OECS, should proceed rapidly, this is unlikely to be the short-term direction for the larger states. Rather, what is perhaps possible is a more gradual, flanking approach, as outlined above. Finally, I want us to think about the rethinking of the moral foundations of the Caribbean. This is an entire field that my colleagues, Anthony Boggs, in exploring what it means to be human in the African diaspora and beyond, and Paget Henry, in his path-breaking study of Afro-Caribbean philosophy, have been grappling with for the last couple of decades. And I suppose in that sense is what the, the church has been grappling with for a, very, for a much longer time. Perhaps this is one of the most difficult questions to address, but it is nonetheless at the core of the present dilemma. It can help explain the growth of violence to the point where individual territories and the Caribbean as a whole is regularly listed as among the most violent regions in the hemisphere and the world. It is captured in, in the Latin American public opinion poll statistics, as we have suggested before, where there are falling levels of interpersonal trust, where the interest in politics in many jurisdictions are at record low levels. It is captured in the notion, as previously mentioned, of hegemonic dissolution, which is accompanied by the breakdown of a moral consensus in which, in the absence of or discrediting of traditional lifestyles associated with earning incomes and building slowly for the future, in which these are being undermined in which the family, already undermined by three decades of migration, is replaced by the godfather, or Don, the head of a criminal family, and in which there is a tremendous attraction to the criminal lifestyle, as the Don, a washing money, becomes a role model for a generation of young men and increasingly young women. A particularly Trinidadian variant on this theme is to be explored in the news that a number of Trinidadian young men want to Islam in Trinidad have been identified as fighting with IS in Syria and Iraq. The possibility that Trinidadian youth might wish to fight in the ranks of the most extreme wing of fundamentalist Islam 
suggests the utter failure of the Trinidadian social and political system to address the deep alienation of a section of the urban poor and the urgency of new approaches to both understanding this alienation and acting against it. Neither new approaches to morality, ethics, nor constitutional and political change can take place outside the context of a political movement. And what is missing in the Caribbean today is a political movement that is able to transcend narrow partisan differences, pose broad questions in ways that will be heard and ultimately debated, and rally people around common causes, both social and political. Elsewhere, I have discussed the possibility of a constituent assembly of the Jamaican people at home and abroad as a vehicle to begin the debate as to where Jamaica, and by extrapolation, the Caribbean, might proceed from this point onwards. But such a vehicle requires a driver. The experience of the last two decades suggests that there is no immediately evident driver, short of a new and unprecedented popular upheaval that would bring such an agency to the fore. However, without such an upheaval, the experience of the past two decades also suggests that what we are looking at, short of a moral renaissance and an accompanying political awakening, is a series of well-recognized turns leading back to decisiveness, divisiveness and sclerosis with no clear exit in sight. Yarimar Bonilla, a Puerto Rican uh, uh, political scientist, in her study of the 2010 French Caribbean demonstrations against metropolitan authority, perhaps the harbinger of what is possible in a new popular movement of the people, suggests that what appeared to be emerging out of the popular mass of people was what she describes as a non-sovereign political imagination. This, she suggested, went beyond the boundaries of the traditional sovereignty ind independence vocabulary. People were beginning to recognize that they had to redefine power as their disillusionment with departmental status and traditional links with France grew. But this was also accompanied by a hard realism that independence, as experienced by many of their neighboring islands, was not by any means the obvious answer. Perhaps from the perspective of the independent neighbors, Dominica, of course, being among those, those states of the Caribbean that have had longer experiences of so-called sovereignty, a similar converging conversation has to begin, recognizing that while the independence project is in many respects bankrupt, politics continues, and new vocabularies will have to be found for a post-sovereign political project that places people at the center of its objectives, deepens democracy, recognizes the transnational significance of the diaspora, and begins a conversation around being, purpose, and the ends of humanity that might transport the people of the Caribbean with meaning and purpose deep into the 21st century. Thank you. There is that ownership and partnership. So I, I, am, I, am, I am not seeing it in our islands, in our countries in the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, you made reference to Barbados. Um, I don't know if I am correct to say it. Does it have to be the level of illiteracy in the islands, with the exception of Barbados, where there is a high um, literacy rate, where you find that there is a movement between two parties in and out, and there is a high level of reading and understanding I may be wrong, but what but help us? But our, 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 our people are not yet there in understanding what happens in Parliament, and you make reference to one man can say something and he just moves. So we don't have, if you look in the Scandinavian countries, the level of democracy and participation that is there, that if one person messes around, they stand forward and they resign. I, I, I don't know where we are going, let alone where we are. Thank you. Well, you have asked around six questions. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to try. Uh, you know, the, the, the rural question, you know, as I said at the very beginning, my first caveat, uh, my only caveat, was that uh, this paper is largely based on Jamaican research. And um, what has happened in Jamaica over the past uh, 20, 30 years is that uh, the, the rural has, has virtually shrunk. Uh, what we have is a series, we, uh, we have a big city which occupies roughly 50% of the population in a city of over a million people. And a number of smaller cities that occupy another 25 to 30%. And then a very small percentage of people are in the countryside. Having said that, 
uh, one of the proposals that I advanced in Jamaica is that we, we, are, we are still in dire need of a land reform. That land reform would go to the rural people primarily. It would readjust the relationship between rural and urban and address that. The specifics of the Dominican case are, are, are to be considered, and um, I, 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 can't, I can't consider them here today. But I, I think that there are quest your, your question is an obvious one, which I agree with, that uh, any proposals for substantial change over the next 50 years that doesn't address a significant part of the pr proposal are not on the books. And if the rural population is a significant part of the Dominican equation, then it has to be brought into the, into the picture. Um, you asked if, le if our leaders are certified. Um, of course they're not. Uh, but you know, to be fair to the leaders in the Caribbean, when I was growing up, and all the heads in this room, um, there was a direction. Um, first of all, there was independence, and that was something to struggle for. We thought that independence would bring certain things. And then there was the revolution. And those of us who were on the left felt that uh, we had to go beyond the independence to really dig deeper to address the issues of divisiveness, of, um, of uh, neocolonialism, and a whole variety of things, which were very real. Um, and there was, there was direction in this respect. Um, what is the direction in the 21st century? What is the project? Um, what is the project that unites people and that gives them a sense of, of, of purpose and a sense of being? Um, that is a problem. It, it's not just that the leaders themselves are, are corrupt or that they have their they're not bright, but they are in a world in which uh, it is not clear what that project is. And part of what I've, I've been trying to do here is for us to begin to think about how we define a project that will take us as a region and as people in individual countries in that region forward in the 21st century. And we haven't found that project. And so you get drifting, and you get, you get little pieces of, um, of, of policy, and you get this and that. And some of these pieces of policy, as I said in the manifestos, are very good. I mean, it's not as though they are just, you know, um, but, but in terms of where we are going, there's no sense. And in the absence of, of, of a direction, you know, people look after themselves or, or, or the chat rubbish. Uh, you know, there are all different things that happen when you have no direction. So um, I want to say the question of illiteracy. Um, Barbados' success was based on a social compact a very clearly defined social compact, uh, which said that um, in exchange for leaving them in peace, in peace, white businessmen would keep their capital in Barbados. Uh, and the taxes would be used to educate black Barbadians. It's a very clear, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not pretending or trying to create a, a racial situation out of, that's the reality in Barbados. That pact allow them uh, to carry out uh, the best social democratic system in the Caribbean. Barbados has never called itself social democratic or socialist or anything, but their system has been a social democratic one. But it's, it's, it's now in a process of collapse. It needs to be rethought. And, uh, but, but the lesson in it is the question of the terms of a social pact and what are the benefits to be derived from it. And in the rest of the islands, we, we mustn't think about uh, the failure of the Barbadian pact so much about what made it successful for 40 to 50 years in, in various ways. It wasn't always the same thing, and it wasn't ever defined in an overtly political way. But it was the most successful social democratic experiment in the Caribbean. Not Jamaica, not Grenada, not um, Guyana, Barbados, the most conservative country carried out in many respects some of the most radical social engineering in the entire Caribbean. We need to learn from that. But we also need to understand why it collapsed, uh, uh, even as uh, you know, the Barbadians with their resourcefulness will rebuild. Now the question of illiteracy is, is, I take that two ways. First of all, Barbadians' literacy, high levels of literacy is critically important in however Barbados is moving forward. But I draw a distinction between literacy and political literacy. The people of the Caribbean are politically literate. They understand politics like the back of their hand. They are political animals. We are political animals. We live politics, we breathe politics. So understanding politics and operating in a political environment is something that we can do. 
and we can discuss and we can participate fully. Participating in the global world of the 21st century, we have to advance the other kind of literacy where we are okay with um, you know, um, ICT and um, uh, information technology forms and communication forms and, and, and you know, I'm heading in that direction because we're not going to make it based on manufacturing. Forget the manufacturing, can't compete with China. We're going to have to enter the, enter the process at a much higher level and that requires education, that requires advanced knowledge. Or we're going to sink. Those are some of the questions you raised. Uh, there were some others, but maybe we can. Yeah. yeah. Yes. In your presentation, you spoke about um, a 53 percent of the population electing government, and uh, you also indicated very early in your presentation that basically you were looking at Jamaica, but that we should try to see the similarities. Um, and the differences. And the differences. Uh, I did some research because I dabbled into politics. I got in and I got out. Um, I realized then, uh, based on my research, is that increasingly over three periods of five years, there was a reducing number of the population that were electing government. So in fact, we were electing uh, minority governments. Um, so that becomes a problem. But more so in relation to some of the recommendations that you were making. Um, I became a bit concerned because I wasn't hearing the link between the policies and the population uh, in terms of their understanding. Because to accept change, um, people must first understand it. They must be able to relate to it. They must have confidence in it. But importantly, they must be able to participate fully in it. So when we have our governments, our ministers, articulating certain positions, economic and otherwise, it is necessary for the population to be able to relate to what they're talking about and to be able to determine whether, in fact, they have confidence and they can support it. Um, I would like to have your uh, well, 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 I, I, can, I, can, I, can, I don't seem to have a mic. I can only agree with you. Uh, uh, what I'm presenting here are, are, are some indicative ideas. Um, as an, uh, what I would consider an engaged academic, an engaged intellectual, my job is my job is, 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 to, is to think about these things. I'm being paid to think about these things, and I'm putting them out there. And it is, it, is, it is for the politicians and ordinary people to see whether any of them make any sense and to adapt them to their own purposes. But um, my job initially is to try to, try to um, understand the currents, and out of that, to try to propose potential ways forward. And that's what I've tried to do in the way I can. But then there's a stage beyond that in which that has to be discussed, as any ideas have to be discussed. And you know, that, that's not necessarily my job. Somebody else's job. Yes. 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 Good night. The, end, the, end, the, the topic beyond the end of sovereignty, recapturing the space for humanity in the Caribbean is a very complex one. I like your critical thinking and your analysis. Um, it's very revealing. Now, you, you spoke about the whole question of the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, social justice and the whole question of the, um, I want to make sure I have it right, yeah, social political space. And of course, you went on to highlight the question of the backwardness in the Caribbean as opposed to what happens to the bigger countries in terms of development. Now, uh, we are speaking a lot about integration, regional integration. Mm -hmm. And what I have found to me, um, I think we are our own worst enemy in the sense that as we speak of um, um, integration, we still find, let's say, even in the micro states, the Caribbean, Dominica, Antigua, the movement and so on, we find that there's still a lot of um, difficulties in terms of, for instance, let me just cite an example. We, if we say we are integrated and we're in one sort of Caribbean basin, if you will, 
Yet, let's say a politician or somebody comes from another country and comes to the Dominica, for instance, or another country and speak, then if it doesn't suit a particular regime or a particular group, uh, we hear about sovereignty and interference, right? Now, I was particularly pleased when I heard yesterday Antigua opened up a bit in the terms of persons, you, you do not need a work permit, and so on and so on. But again, as we speak of the Caribbean initiative and so on, Caribbean basin, we, we see in Bahamas, for instance, although it's not really Caribbean per se, the Haitians, with their children being born in, the, in Haiti, in Bahamas, they, they are being sent back or they are told that they, are not, you know, they haven't got rights. I mean, how, 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 how do we approach that? If we say we want Caribbean integration, and yet we see that sort of defeating end, I mean, I want you to speak to that and, 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 and craft it in a way and tell us, you know, do you think that we, we really working towards that integration movement that we're seeking, or are we defeating the purpose? Yeah. A successful Windward Islands Union would lay the foundation. It would be like a vanguard. It's, it's just, you know, the, the, the smallest shall lead them, you know. The, it's a vanguard. Uh, the last country in the Anglophone Caribbean that should come into a union is Jamaica. Right? Not because of anything apart from the fact that Jamaica, with its distance, has... Jamaica should never have been involved in the Federation from the beginning. It should have been an Eastern Caribbean Federation. And success would have brought Jamaica in, eventually. And it would have added to the success. But the process of bringing Jamaica in from stage one, uh, you know, and we're speaking with hindsight, 2020 vision, doomed Federation, because Jamaica was not ready for that sort of integration. I still think it applies. Um, but having said that, that's just my little inside, inside sense of how things should move. Um, you can't force integration on people who don't want it. And, you know, if, 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 if in Antigua the governing elite or even the people feel that Dominicans are taking away jobs, you, you can't force them to say, no, we're not taking away jobs. Um, let us in. It has to be something that has to grow out of um, social and political movements in the various countries of the Caribbean, and that is not something that you can invent or create. Um, uh, yes, Jamaicans uh, don't have any problem with movement in the region because we have always moved. We're all, we already all over the place. Um, and we don't mind people coming to Jamaica because people hardly come to Jamaica. So when they come, we say, welcome. How long, how long you want to stay for? Right? As a matter of fact, if you want to leave, we're vexed. Right? Uh, but that's just a particular thing. Trinidad, which is really, the, in many respects, a hub of the Caribbean, you know, all you need is one generation of somebody being Trinidad, and they say, don't, don't let it anymore, Vincentians. Who is your mother, Vincentian? Who is your father, Grenadian? Don't let them in anymore. Uh, so there are all of these island peculiarities that we have to move beyond. So uh, thinking about it, there is no simple way forward or no, no magic formula. What it would seem to me is that what the OACS is doing now is perhaps the best possible thing for the rest of the care. If the OACS can achieve a union that works, if it is successful, then it will, it will be the vanguard for the rest of the Caribbean. And, and my Caribbean vision, by the way, doesn't stop at the English-speaking, so-called English-speaking borders. Right? It extends. Cuba, Haiti, the Dominican Republic when they can solve their problems, etc. That is my vision of the Caribbean. Yes. Now, do you think because we are the victims of the forces of nature, where a storm can wipe out an economy in the you, where we are the whims and fantasies of the developed countries, do you think all of that has sort of creating the psyche where we are therefore afraid to plan long term because we just cannot envision what will happen. And do you think there is a correlation from your experience between the wealthy countries and long term planning? Is there a correlation then that the wealthier the country, the longer the plan or the vision is longer? Well, thank you. Very, very interesting question. The Caribbean people are among the most audacious set of people that I can think of in the world. 
you know, look at look at look at Usain Bolt, and uh, you know, or, or any number of Caribbean athletes in the Olympic Stadium. They, they, they're coming from these little countries with hundred thousand people, a million people. What's the difference? Um, yet when they stand up in the place, you know, people, you know, people have gone to Bolt and said, "Where's your country on a map?" And he pointed to Jamaica and said, "No, you can't come from that because you know you come from a big country." Right? You can't come from this little point, this little pin, pin prick on a map. We are an extraordinary, aud extraordinarily audacious people. That is our strength in the world. Um, I don't, I think, in a sense, that our governments and our, we have been battered, not just by uh, meteorological storms but by, uh, and other events, but by the winds of globalization. And what we need to do is recover that side of our people that have, um, you know, conquered the world. You know, I, I, I like Francis Severin, I, I'm, I'm a public art and, and, and at Mona, and for, I'm fortunate to have to write speeches, citations every year for people who have done remarkable things. This year I did one for a Grenadian named Earl Brathwaite. Anybody in this room know Earl? Ever heard of him? Um, anybody has a, an iPhone? And you know the iPhone has a little white plug that you plug into the wall to charge it. Anybody with an iPhone? And you know the plug? Earl Brathwaite designed that plug, right? Uh, a Grenadier, right? Um, now, now, what was Earl's story? Earl went to Silicon Valley 20 years ago um, and worked with Intel. After around 10 years with Intel, he decided, no, he's going to set up his own company. And he has set up a company which um, has, uh, when, when I list the things that he has designed, right? His company is, is now a billion dollar company. I don't know how much he earns. The company itself is around a billion dollars. But uh, that particular instrument, he looked at the power sources that the average phone had and says, why does the, the power plug have to be as big as the phone? And he went to the technical people uh, in his company and they said, no, it can't be smaller. It can't be done. Right? And Earl says, no, it can't be done. And I am going to do it. And I'm going to do it. And he went around all over Silicon Valley and eventually um, he managed, and you know, he sat down with me one night and explained this, managed to design this plug, which is no bigger than, the, than a regular plug for anything, which is, you know, Sorry, I forget that in, I'm in Dominica where you have a big, big, big 220 volt. <laughs> 220, which is no bigger than a regular 120 volt plug, right? Um, and when Apple heard that he was doing this thing, they called him and they said, sell us. And he eventually sold it to Apple. I'm making the point to suggest that there are dozens and hundreds of Caribbean people in the world who operate like that, and that there's a part of our culture and being which doesn't recognize the fact that we come from a small place at all. But in fact, we come from a very big place, which, is ha which happens to be small in, in area. And that, I think, is what we have to build on culturally um, if we're going to operate in this world of the 21st century. So I don't know if I've answered your question. But that's how I got around to it. I don't think we have a problem, in other words. We just need to recapture ourselves and to put it out there. Yes, sir. And the risk of being controversial. You know, um, when you spoke about the, the lack of vision as a Caribbean people, and I was very interested, as Mr. Irish pointed out, your title of your, 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 your speech. Um, that is, that sovereignty um, and in the global space and what sovereignty is. Do you not think that the Caribbean as a people, um, especially since independence, are living in a virtual space? In other words, they're living in their minds in a space where they're not living in their bodies. And notwithstanding Mr. Breathway for that example, it seems to me that the Caribbean has been lost in their sense of self, and I would point it to tourism, because tourism has created this space of unreality, you know, especially I've been to Jamaica and Barbados, as you mentioned. It's an unreality that's totally disconnected from the people's lives. 
Yet it's the basis of their economy. I mean, most Caribbean countries is 90% of the economy. And so you have this other thing that's created this madness that we have in the Eastern Caribbean, and you're totally wrong about the OECS. In fact, the Eastern Caribbean is already one state. It has one money and one court. As far as I know, is as far as the King's Rip ran, and as far as his coin ran that created a state. Yet you have six petty tyrants who do all kind of nonsense with this petty sovereignty. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. The Eastern Caribbean, the 650,000 people have 120 representatives and six presidents or governor generals, which are a tremendous drain on our economy. And yet they use this not to advance the populace, they advance themselves, especially in this country. So you have this situation. Really, I mean, somebody who comes from nowhere to become a millionaire in 10 years, absurdly, grossly, disgusting, right? And yet, right, we accept this as a people, and we're not throwing stones and Molotov cocktails, right, they're doing in the rest of the world. We sit patiently in this petty bourgeois unreality, right? Now, you, that's, the, that's the sovereignty I'm spoken about, that we mistakenly think that we're sovereign. Absurdly, because none of these six governments have maybe 10% maneuverability, as you saw in the manifesto. So that's one of the problems. The other problem is in our global space. Wouldn't you agree that the world economy has become global tribes? There's the Chinese tribe. There's the European tribe. I think there was an intellectual that wrote a book about that, that the world has become, not economically, global tribes. Chinese are all over the world. Indians all over the world, Europeans, I mean, what's the difference between France and, and America, as you can see with the mistrial? France is ready to fire a thousand workers, lose two billion dollars over a political squabble that the United States has with Russia. And so, isn't it because we've lost our sense of Africanness, of the fact that we belong to the African global tribe, and that even these countries, they have so many relations with these European countries, why is there not a CARICOM AU summit every other year? Why are we not embracing this cultural reality in a political sense? Because it's the culture that has given us all. All the examples we spoke of unity and progress have to do with culture. If we really harness our culture, entertainment, and sports. And this is what we have to address. And I think that intellectuals, as well as your people, have to tell people that in no uncertain terms. You have to teach students that we have to develop our Africanness. That's what Rasta brought to the Caribbean. And I was killed in Jamaica. And as important as it is in Jamaica, people wouldn't understand how suppressed Rasta is in Jamaica. And so why are we like that? Why are we playing like we're Europeans? We're still doing this. And the unity of purpose that was here was because we were fighting against the same colonialists when we became independent. But these stupid guys, once they got power, they forgot the purpose. It became their pocket. Wouldn't you not agree, Professor? Well, <laughs> there's very little. There's very little, very little that you have said that I can disagree with. Um, I would want to suggest that how we define the Caribbean, um, particularly in the light of um, large East Indian populations in both Guyana, Suriname, in, in three, Guyana, Suriname, and Trinidad, has to be inclusive. Uh, it also has to be inclusive when you consider the fact that we think of a wider Caribbean and you have uh, different population compositions in at least three other very large Caribbean countries. Um, Cuba, uh, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. But for the countries of, of largely African descent, uh, what you say is abso absolutely dead on target. Um, I want to address the question of tourism uh, for a moment. Um, tourism is problematic, but I think you've touched on one of the, the critical questions. What do we really gain from tourism? What do we gain from um, we gained some, we gained some, we, I mean, you know, when, when, when the big ship came in this morning, um, I was thinking very much about it, because where I live in Kingston, we send them sea door ships. They don't come to Kingston, they go to the north coast. And the size of the ship really struck me. Um, this massive thing came in. It, it would be interesting to find out what, how much Dominica benefited from that ship. 
and what were the negatives on it. I, I really do think that that cruise shipping in particular. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, cruise shipping in particular is, is a sphere of tourism that we have to, um, to really rethink. Um, um, I mentioned in my, in my talk all-inclusive tourism, which is similar to cruise shipping in that you, you, you put a, it's like a ship on land. You know, you have, you have a wall around it yeah, and, and, and nobody comes in or goes out. What are the benefits to the country from an there's an initial benefit. I mean, for example, this year in Grenada, um, Sanders um, entered the Grenadian market and the construction industry went through the roof because Sanders rebuilt a hotel that already existed. Um, that was in 2013. In 2014, the con construction industry is down again because Sanders is not building another hotel. But beyond the building phase, there are huge questions around tourism. It's time for a rethink of the benefits of tourism. I don't think we will reach the point where we abandon it, um, but we need to rethink it. We need to rethink the benefits, the value added, the linkages to the rest of the economy, um, and uh, on that basis, go forward. Um, you know, the, um, but many of your points, sir, um, I take on board. Um, indeed, um, I agree with, including the, the critical one of culture, that, that Unless we have a foundation and, and recapture that belief in ourselves um, as to who we are and where we are going, uh, we're not going anywhere. And that is critical. I'm sure that's trivial. It is our comparison. But the, 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 the bigger point here is, is how can we leverage that into something that actually is much bigger than tourism? Right? Uh, how, how do we leverage it? You know, I use the example of, of a Nashville Hollywood complex because, frankly, how, how was Hollywood created in a, in a most unlikely place, place on a, a sort of desert town, a, 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 a Mexican, quasi-Mexican desert town on, on the edge of North America? Why wasn't Hollywood in um, New Jersey or, or you know, somewhere between DC and New York, somewhere. Um, why, how, was, how, how did Hollywood become Hollywood? Why is there no Caribbean Hollywood or a series of Caribbean Hollywoods? In other words, uh, accumulating synergies around our culture, around our music, that feed back into not only software, but hardware, uh, into education, and into tourism, right? So there is no complex, um, um, I say Alvin is in the room and you may tell me, you, you, you know, you're, this is the kind of thing that I know you delve into. But there is, there, 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 is no, there is no complex set of industries that feed on each other and that like a magnet attract new industries. And you know, I'm not, I'm not saying where these things would be located or whether they need to be located in a single city or in a variety of different places in the Caribbean but that uh, would make us, for instance, the capital of world music. There's no reason why the Caribbean can't be the, the way in which Nashville is the capital of country, that the Caribbean can't be the capital of world music. And we don't only accumulate the Caribbean forms, but the African forms here as well, and the South American forms and everything. And people come here to record, uh, and, you know, and they come here to, to do all the things related to that. So uh, yes, I, I take your points on board. Good night. Um, independence here and where we are now. For example, even Dominica after 36 years. It is clear that the constitution that was handed to us after 36 years did some serious reviewing and tweaking to our present reality. Now, one of the things you said is that the whole question of the winner takes it for in political in, um, elections. And I'm thinking that even in Dominica, for example, we have 21 constituencies. And within those constituencies, the population varies sometimes. You have, you have a constituency that does have about 600 votes, whereas you have others with 200 votes. But somebody can win by one vote in a constituency where 2,000 voters vote. Somebody can win by five votes. 
and the, 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 the other person who probably got a thousand, another one got a thousand five, the one who got a thousand five wins. But in the other constituency, we have just 600 total voters vote. You find a thousand and five people who voted in the other constituency, they are disenfranchised because of the winner takes it called principle. And because of that type of policy or, or, or law, what it does is it gives people who have the political power a type of entrenched political power and entitlement where they figure out they are in a position where they can unilaterally take decisions without even considering that, or you know, a thousand people actually voting who themselves have things that have to be addressed in the overall policy, policy construct of the nation. Now the question is, how do we begin the process? Because we make a lot of nice commentary throughout the night. How do we begin the process of first deconstructing that type of policy that exists or what exists now, the norms, and begin to reconstruct something that is more applicable to our situation where we are now. And I like what Henry said, we are people who seem to be just floating. We, we, we seem not to know where we are going and even where our competitive advantage is. It seems almost like we have none. And I do not believe that because even the Jamaica you talk about is showing us how they have been collaborating for trade with their diaspora people. Jamaica is now producing uh, 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 Accra powder that you can make Accra in New York as a Jamaica. And I think if you're saying that 70% of our educated people are in the diaspora, doesn't that suggest that we have a, a ready market? People who are familiar with the goods that we actually produce in those small islands, I think in reconstructing the way forward, these are the new type of ideas that we have to start to innovate. Well, and that is in part what, what thank you, what, what, what I'm trying to say, that, I mean, there is no, we, we, need, we need to begin to think in, in terms of the big picture and where we're going again. And your proposal is one such thing. But in terms of the constitutional changes, there, there are certain steps that need to be taken. And, and, and one of them that seems to me to be obvious is that an electoral commission has got to be uh, politically neutral either politically neutral or incorporating all the political forces in such a way that, that nobody has the advantage. Certainly the incumbents can't set the rules. No, I mean, we, we might think this is an obvious thing, but in most uh, American uh, states, the incumbents set the rules. The most, one of the most gerrymandered countries in the world is the United States of America, uh, you know, in, in which if, if you have... Um, black people in three parts of the state, and you divide the constituents in such a way that it looks like a snake, and all of the black people vote for one person and in one constituency, and that constituency is out, and then the people who are in the other places get three or four, cons uh, you know, three or, three or four uh, seats. Uh, gerrymandering is possible when the incumbents set the rules. You have to take that away from the incumbents. How can the incumbents, the people who are actually in charge, of the government decide on the voting system. Uh, one of the biggest successes that Jamaica had, and believe me, we are no, no um, saints in this measure, but is in establishing our electoral commission as free of the power of the government. That happened from 1980. And the result has been, in the last election that we had, it was highly contested, very contentious, but nobody questioned the result. The result was considered clean. The vote list, voting list was considered as clean. The constituencies were considered as balanced and so on. That addresses the question of, of unfairness. And you know, um, we've had one revolution, so to speak, in English-speaking Caribbean and Grenada. And it, uh, the Grenada revolution was possible because Eric Gehry was, was the king of the gerrymanderers. Right? And he had created a system that led to a large number of people feeling that the only way we could change this thing was, was outside of the ballot. Right? Um, that was how Grenada was possible. It wasn't because um, 
NGM people just managed to have a couple of guns, it was because a large part of the population felt that the way forward could not be achieved by constitutional means. Therefore, that is something that needs to be addressed. It doesn't address questions like uh, whether we should have first pass the post or proportional. Those need to be looked at in the context of the country and, and decisions made. Um, in the case of Jamaica, I think that we need to have a proportional upper house. Right now, our Senate is, is um, nominated. You know, because we were modeling ourselves of the House of Lords. And since we don't have any Lords, we nominated our Lords and called them Senators. I mean, give me a break. Um, we need to have, I think we should elect that proportionally so that you get a sense in the Senate of people who are elected by the country as a whole. Constituencies are problematic. I think the, the, the um, brother at the back was making the point about the problem of one being large, one being small, but yet. Uh, but constituencies have the advantage that the person represents an area of the country. He or she is responsible for the roads, the bridges, and so on in that area. And when you have proportional, oftentimes the person is representing the whole country and don't know anything about what is happening in Portsmouth, Bill, or, 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 or you know, wherever it may be. Um, so I, I, I just think that we need to think it through. But the principle must first of all be take the machinery of elections out of the hands of the incumbents or anybody and make it a neutral institution. And that indeed, as you know, Professor, seriously um, impacts in a negative way on the socio-economic development of any jurisdiction. Um, having mentioned Dodo Scope, and we see um, over 72 or 73 people um, who, who succumbed or died as a result. Was that, given the Jamaica situation, perhaps a, a, a catalyst for the peaceful or subtle um, replacement of Bruce Golding, um, because we know that he was under severe pressure. Um, secondly, what, as it stands now, what's the relationship with the United States of America and Jamaica in, in the context of national uh, security? And thirdly, um, given the same Dodoscope saga, uh, that, that, that phenomenal example for Caribbean, the, the Caribbean what, what measures would you, or recommendations, would you um, enunciate here with respect to Caribbean governments? Because they move around in CARICOM, discuss Caribbean uh, issues, but, um, security issues. But we see the, the potential uh, perennial global threat um, and criminal threat. Um, what are the prescriptions that they can uh, adopt to medicate the, this malady, crime malady, um, global threats in, in the Caribbean, given the fact that even right now, as we as we're here in Dominica, and the political electioneering is going on, and so many things are being discussed, but if it's one thing for governments to be sustained, if we're talking about sovereignty, is to ensure that the jurisdictions are peaceful. What are your recommendations, sir? Thank you very much. Very enclaves within the city of Kingston, right? In other words, to, to become elected, you create a fortress. And that fortress is beholden, the members of that fortress are beholden to you, right? And they will not only fight to the death for you because you have provided them with housing, living, etc but they will roam across the island and ensure that you are victorious wherever you need any help. 
And that is the, 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 the historical development of Tivoli Gardens, is a snapshot of what to avoid in any other part of the Caribbean. And there's no other part of the Caribbean that, 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 that is a facsimile of that. You know, all instances are different. But the lesson to be learned is that when politics is manipulated so that power bec becomes the, the, the end all of the engagement, then you are going to get outcomes that tend in that direction. They won't look exactly the same, right? But what happened is that you create a monster, and then the, the, you create Frankenstein, frankly, and then Frankenstein is no longer beholden to you for survival. Frankenstein is going to survive on his own. And what happened is that Frankenstein started to operate on his own, uh, but was still supporting uh, the government. And um, when the United States came in, the government didn't know what to do. It, it was torn between its, its treaty obligations, which said that Frankenstein should be sent away, and its historic 40-year connection to this community, now represented by this man who was now autonomous of them. That is a peculiarly Jamaican narrative which led to the crisis of 2010. Um, but the lesson is to undermine the constitutional features of Westminster that give absolute power to the victors and banish the losers to the political wilderness. Cut the ground from under the necessity to win at whatever cost by making by, by lev um, for example, one of the things I, I said on, on, on a radio program here this morning was, um, and this may sound odd, but when you lose an election, you go into what we call the political wilderness. Why not make former prime ministers, assuming they were honest and served their term and are not guilty of corruption and graft and what have you, why not appoint them to uh, a council of elders who can give good advice to the new prime minister? Give them a job. So, no, listen to me. So when you lose, you still are somebody in the world. Right? Therefore, losing doesn't have the same edge that it does when you lose and you no longer have the outriders and you no longer have the privileges and you no longer can fly anywhere you want, and you feel as though you're, so therefore you're never going to want to lose. So one of the ways to do it in a sort of backhanded way is to give them a role. The United States has understood this for generations. Pre presidents are always called Mr. President, and they're always respected. They always have secure, um, um, members of the Secret Service looking after them, and they have a presidential library, and they open buildings, and they do things like Bill Clinton, and so on and so forth. Uh, Jimmy Carter is still doing stuff with his Carter Center. Um, by giving them a role beyond their election, then losing is not as crucial. Right? And therefore, the desire to win at any cost may not be as crucial. That's one side of the equation that I want us to think about, right? Um, uh, as to how we, how we approach it. So the broader question is to create a system that uh, the opposition has some role in the legislative process, has some role in the distributive process, and therefore doesn't feel as though, uh, so the incumbent government will know when it loses, it will still have a role to play. That is one of the ways to undermine the, the, the sort of system that led to the emergence of Tivoli Gardens. But maybe, maybe I'm mistaken about human nature and it will continue in the same way. But I think this, we need to think about it and think beyond it. Yes. We have one more question. Yes. The gentleman in the back was asking for that. Yes. It would seem, as you spoke about vision, a nation cannot create a vision unless the people of the nation are participating in the creation of that vision. And so it seemed that the fundamental question is, are we, as a Caribbean people, participants, or are we recipients? Recipients puts us in the back seat and we wait for political leaders, whoever they are, to make the decision and tell us what our vision is. It's a, it won't work. We have 
we have generations of years of colonial experience. If I don't like what you're saying, I cannot fight you, but I can defeat you. Colonialism taught us that. I just won't support you, and it will die, no matter how good you think it is. But it would seem then that we as a people have to determine we will be participants. Political leaders, we don't answer to parliamentary representatives. Parliamentary representatives answer to the people of their constituency. We tell them what we want done. But it would seem that you have to get into the justice and the human rights of people to determine if I don't like how you're performing, I should have the legal right to remove you from office. Well, you know, I, 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 I hear you and I agree with you in principle. I certainly agree with what you have said. Um, except I'm, I'm one of those optimists who believe that the Caribbean people have never really let go of their notions of rights and justice. And if, if you know what, I'm an, a collector of, of um, Jamaican music. And um, when I listen to the new generation of singers, of dancehall artists, and so on, I'm hearing the same messages that I heard with Bob Marley and Peter Tosh. They're talking about rights. They're talking against justice. They're talking about culture. They're talking about a better world. Um, all of these things are still alive and well. Yeah, you know, people talk about slapness in the music, and uh, that's there as well. But I mean, the, the core um, uh, questions of resistance, of of heritage, uh, are still there. So I think that the flame of of um, human rights and justice and equal rights and justice is very much there amongst the people. Um, the question is the way forward. And one of the things that I said, and I'd like to end on that note again, is that uh, we've had, in the 20th century, two waves, two big waves in the Caribbean. One was in the 1930s, um, the upheavals of the 1930s, which brought universal adult suffrage in the 1940s and ultimately independence. And the second was the upheaval beginning in 1968 and that lasted for 10 years, or just over 10 years, until the, 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 the end of the Grenada Revolution, which was uh, an upsurge, which had its roots in not only the failure of the, the movement of the 1930s to fulfill its objectives, but also a broader international wave that was saying that uh, the world of mid to late 20th century uh, capitalism wasn't working properly, and 1968, is very important because in that year there was a worldwide revolt against things. Uh, and that movement in the, its Caribbean dimension collapsed in the 1980s for very specific reasons. Collapse was destroyed. And we've been living in the aftermath of that. Uh, and the point I'm making here is that uh, a social movement will have to come out of the Caribbean, a third movement. And um, that, that is not going to happen because I say so, what is going to happen when the Caribbean people are ready for it to happen? And the form it is going to take, I don't know. But uh, it will happen, and I'm convinced it will. And it will advance many of these things, and many things which are not being discussed here on the social agenda. And that is my, that is my own historical sweep of the past uh, century, really, and, 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 and those distinct waves. Uh, throughout your remarks, I found sometimes you were, you, were, you were pessimistic, sometimes you were optimistic, you know? And I mean, and you see, the fact that we have life and the, and the good um, the among seniors is, is, is there. You know, we have to be optimistic, you know? I mean, challenges have to be overcome. You know, problems have to be resolved, you know? So there's no need to be pessimistic, okay? Um, I mean, having said that, though, like the point you made about being in the political wilderness, Yes. You, know, you know, it's a good thing to be in the political wilderness. You know, it's an opportunity for you to, for you, for you to be introspective, to look within, you know, for you to reveal yourself, for you to renew. I mean, sometimes people forget that the current government was in the wilderness for about 20 years. You know, when, when Patrick John fell in, 19, in 1979, 
or you know, or, or, or the Delmont, which I'm following Eugenia Charles there for 15 years. The Ulog was there for approximately four and a half. So that, that is about 20 right there. And it's a good thing to go in the wilderness. You look, you look internally. So nothing wrong with the wilderness. Okay? I mean, at the same time, like the United States, like you mentioned, you could utilize the, the, the wisdom of having been in office. Nothing wrong with that. But then you also have mentioned some of the difficulties in the US with um, gerrymandering. So the US itself has its imperfections. Um, the, the other thing I want to mention is that um, in, in the question of sovereignty, I mean, I appreciate the point made on sovereignty, but you, you forgot to mention that the people are sovereign. And, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the people that go and choose their leaders. And, they, and in that three subdivision of sovereignty, I would want to, I would want to suggest a fourth which will incorporate the role of the people in sovereignty. Because at the end of the day, it's the people that are choosing the leaders, you know? Okay, the, the, just two, two more points. Um, the question of the courts, the courts. You know, I mean, the, the Westminster system we're talking about, you have the executive, you have the legislative, and you have the judiciary. And somehow there, you, you, know, you miss that judicial component. It, it, it has to play a key role in, in the resolution of your know, disputes. And, and I think that it, 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 that is where the question of um, unbiasedness and fairness is in that ball of water. And generally, in the Caribbean region, we, the courts, the courts are, are, have a good reputation for that. So, I mean, we have to ensure that they continue to function that way. And my final point is that you, you, and I thank you very much for, for the OECS integration, your positive remarks on that. Um, and, um, but I want to say that the, the point about the statement about the CSA being a failure, I, I think, you know, I, I mean, you know, although there may be some truth in that, but someone in your caliber, you know, you know I, I run the comment of that. Especially since right now, the CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice, which is so crucial, you know, is like the nerve center of this, you know, for example, in the OECS, we've had the OECS Court of Appeal, and that has been functioning, as Henry mentioned, the, the um, single currency. Those two things, in fact, predated a lot, you know, the current treaty, the current Union treaty. But I think, you know, um, you know it's no coincidence uh, that, that, you know, it, you know uh, Boston Manti and the Federation that won them when of Jamaica, I'm not blaming you personally, that's a historical fact. <laughs> but to come again and to not support the CCJ, I mean, something wrong with that one. Because this, that is part of the reason why the CSME, you know, may not succeed. Because the lead countries in the region, the OECS is going forward with the CSME, with the CCJ, don't become particularly spearheaded in that. And, the, and, and from where I sit, I know the others are coming along. But the lead country in terms of population in Jamaica is staying away from that. It would be good to tell us your own perspective on that. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to be very quick. Uh, most of what you said, I've agreed with. So I'm not going to go there. But I, I, I just want to, including the, the optimism question. So I, I don't want to go there. But I just want to look at the CCJ question. Um, this is a classical instance of what I'm talking about, about uh, opposition and governments and how they have to find a way to move beyond the opposition government um, binary in which when a government is in power, it is for something. As soon as it becomes opposition, anything the government in power is doing, that its senses might be unpopular, it will oppose it because its sense is that it can win an election with that. That is what sunk the federation in Jamaica, by the way, um, because um, Bustamante was for federation, uh, late in the game, but for it, until he saw it could win, and then he switched and became against it. Um, but it's the same thing with CCJ. Um, both governments were, were for CCJ, uh, uh, the Caribbean Court of Justice. I know that um, uh, the PNP has pushed it forward. The JP is now opposing it, and um, uh, senses that it might have a new federation on its hand if it if it gets that right. So we have to look at how how we are governed and the role of oppositions and the role of governments, um, because we can't continue like that. The CCJ uh, will have to happen. The British are tired and sick and tired of, of all, us using up their. They're, they're good lords for our own purposes. They want to get throw us out. And one day they're going to tell us, come out of my house. At which point we are then going to be faced with having to, you know, to try to do something about it. But so, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. But I want to make the point that, that the system of government in the Caribbean, based on uh, sharp oppositional politics, has a positive in it in that a single party and a single government will become too corrupt in a very short period of time. 
So we need to have somebody to shake them up. And therefore, I like your point about the political wilderness. There's something good about the political wilderness as well as something bad. But um, we cannot have a system in which every time a measure has short-term benefit for the opposition, it jumps on it, even when the opposition itself knows that it is good for the country in the long run because it sees the possibility that it can win an election. Same thing applies to the government. I don't want to, 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 you know, to stand on the opposition's head in this case. But, but, but the system of opposing for the sake of winning an election, when it is against the interests of the country, we need to find a way around that. And we need to think through what that means and how we can avoid that. It may mean setting aside a set of issues that are, we consider to be long-term interests of the country. It could be fiscal policy, it could be educational policy, it could be health policy, it could be cultural policy to address um, my brother's thing about a, a cultural agenda in the back. And we said those are off electioning, electioneering. Those are not a part of the electioneering question. We will electioneer depending on how you implement the policy, but not on the policy itself. And in that way, we may move beyond some of those sharp oppositional uh, 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 questions. And over time, we might decide that um, you know, not everything has to fit into that framework, but there must be some policies that are given 20, 30 years to work themselves out, provided they begin with consultation of the people. You know, if it's just the two parties deciding, well, we're going to do this, it can't be so. But, but a policy on health, for instance, or a policy on fiscal um, arrangements, which is thoroughly discussed by the entire population, and we agree that we would operate within a certain framework and for the next 10 years or 15 years. Then a government is judged on its management as opposed to some entirely new policy that is drawn out of the air to win an election. That seems to me to be an area that we want to think about. Thank you very much. Sir, I want to thank you all for your questions. Very, very good questions. I'm sure you're going to take this discussion outside, inside here, and after today, and I encourage you to keep the, the discussions going. At this point, I want to add, though, that I was very heartened to hear the discussions and questions around vision, and I remember your question, Mrs. Uh, your question about the vision there, and I recall John Compton in St. Lucia when he, visionary that he was, built the river dams in St. Lucia knowing the rivers were going to dry, so there is that level of visionary in the Caribbean, and I'm very happy that we had that conversation. At this point, I want to ask our partner in the Charles Foundation, Mr. Demos Southwell, to lead us in the word of thanks, and then we will leave. I wish you all a good night and safe journey back home. Thank you very much.